Well, hey guys, it's your friend Spencer here. We're going to be going through The Tragedy of Compromise by Ernest Pickering. We've been going chapter by chapter through this book, and I hope it's been a great blessing to you, which certainly has been to me. This is really one of the uh, one of my favorite authors and one of the best books he ever wrote was this one. So we're going to go chapter by chapter through this book, give you a lot of the good highlights in it, and uh, we have to do that that way because this book is actually out of print. And so we're going to go to chapter four at this time. So in chapter three, we see the rise of Billy Graham and ecumenicism and how that there was this game being played where doctrine was kind of put on the back burner for the sake of evangelism. And the, the idea was, you know, as long as we get crowds together, as long as we get people coming to Christ, then all this other doctrinal stuff, it, it's, just, it's just a distraction. So let's set doctrine aside and let us try to unite for the cause of Christ. But the problem is, is that when doctrine goes, everything else falls too. And throughout this chapter, we're going to see a series of dominoes that fail in evangelicalism. And uh, I think you'll be very interested in the things that are said here. So basically, you have men like Akengay, you have Carl Henry, you have Billy Graham. And these were the faces, the first generation of this new evangelicalism. Well, just like many compromising movements, the next generation took it to a different level to a point where it actually even alarmed men like Carl Henry to see how bad these people had gotten. You know, you compromise just a little in this generation where the next generation takes it this far. And that's exactly what happened with evangelicalism. And so now you had neo-evangelicalism, which was a movement in between modernism and fundamentalism. Well, another group emerged, which was what they called the left-wing evangelicals. This crowd was very worldly and limited and even demeaned what they called doctrinal rigidity. And in time, the evangelicals got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse into more of a modernistic position. The book even says it's in the middle of page 78. One could add that it has ceased creeping and is now running. There are new evangelical churches who boast about repatriating fundamentalists. All manner of wild accusations are raised against fundamentalists who, according to these prophets of gloom, have saddled the people of God with ridiculous and impossible rules and regulations and thus stunted their growth in the Lord. A good many people are attracted to such churches because they carry chips on their shoulders against the fundamentalist churches in which they were raised. And so I see this a lot even today. You know, people are they're bitter because they had rules in a fundamentalist church growing up. It, it really is very common, a very common accusation of the evangelical world against fundamentalists. As we see, there's these dominoes that start falling in evangelicalism, especially left-wing evangelicalism. The first domino that fell was the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture, which always is the first domino to fall in any man's life. I mean, if you don't believe we have a Bible that's authoritative, then all your theology becomes subjective at that point. And that is the problem that we have in evangelicalism. And it happened here. Now, as far as the inspiration of Scripture goes, it was the idea that the Bible is, is mostly correct, but it's not like totally correct, which is like saying, you know, he's, the Bible is not 100% accurate, but it's like, you know, 99% accurate, which is a problem because if it's God's Word, then it's perfect. And if you don't believe the Bible is perfect and inspired, given by God, then what do you, how do you know anything about God? How do you have any authority to base your theological views on? The, the truth is you don't. And so... Uh, that became a big problem. The book says in the bottom of page 78, later a professor at Fuller Seminary, Paul King Jewett, produced a volume entitled Man is Male and Female, in which he concluded that Paul was a victim of his culture and erred in making some of the statements he had made concerning female subordination. He declared that the Bible could still be authoritative to believers, even though it contains errors such as this. And for those of you who saw Third Adam 3, you understand the, the duality there, the divine feminine and things like that. So that's a problem, saying that, you know, the Bible's the Word of God, but at the same time, some of the things that Paul said were wrong theologically. And uh, the Bible is not like some buffet that you can pick and choose what you like. Either you take it as a whole, as authoritative, or you don't. Uh, but there are people in evangelical seminaries, professors at these colleges, who were saying, you know, the Bible's good and authoritative and all, but, you know, some of the things that Paul said were not really true. And, and that's a big, big problem. Now, this really kind of set off a firestorm in evangelicalism 
really over is the Bible the inspired Word of God or not? Which, you know, you think as a Christian university, a Christian college, this should be settled, but it really, it, it, it had become undone through the infiltration of modernism. Now, Harold Lindell, the book says on the top of page 79, Harold Lind Lindell, who has impeccable credentials as one of the early new evangelicals, produced a blockbuster with his volume, The Battle for the Bible. He clearly shows that many so-called evangelicals have jettisoned the doctrine of inerrancy and openly state that the Bible contains errors. His chapter on the strange case of Fuller Theological Seminary can details the internal struggles of the faculty of the school over the question of biblical inspiration. And it even says there that Lindsay was one of the original faculty members at Fuller. You have people openly teaching in Bible colleges that are openly saying that the Bible's not perfect which is a major theological problem. We're not arguing culottes anymore. We are arguing a core essential doctrine. The book goes on to say, Fuller Seminary replied to Lenzel in a special publication entitled The Authority of Scripture at Fuller. The document makes clear that the Fuller Seminary does not hold to the doctrine of biblical inerrancy or infallibility as this historically has been understood among Bible-believing Christians. Fuller has redefined the terms. The Bible is infallible in matters of faith and practice but contains various errors. Some of them prefer the term inconsistencies in matters of lesser importance. One of the writers, William Lasore, declared the Bible to be, quote, remarkably reliable and accurate. But this is a far cry from stating that the Bible is infallible. The same writer comments, quote, There is in my mind a clear difference between saying that the Bible is entirely without error in all that it teaches and in saying that the Bible is without error in all matters such as Ge geology, astronomy, genealogy figures, etc., when these matters are not essential to the teaching of the context. So it's saying that there's historical inaccuracies in it, but it's still good for doctrine and it's still good for who God is and, and beliefs and teachings. Guys, this is a huge deal. This is a gigantic deal because if the Bible's not correct about you know some fringe detail of somebody's genealogy, then how do we know the Bible's correct about salvation? How do we know the Bible's correct about the gospel? How do we know the Bible's correct about it? Jesus Christ being the only way to heaven? How do we know anything? And this is a, a dreadful assault on the Word of God done within the ranks of evangelicalism, especially at Fuller Theological Seminary. Guys, doctrine matters. It, it, it matters. And... This is just a perfect example of the fact that evangelicalism promotes unity over doctrine. So the first domino to fall was the inerrancy of the Bible. The second domino that really fell in evangelicalism was the idea of evolution and creationism versus evolution. Now, basically what you have, have is evangelicalism is very agreeable. They want to get along. And then also, number two, evangelicalism really values academia. They want to be respected by the academic world. And that's really was one of their philosophies is that, you know, fundamentalists are viewed by the scientific community as just a bunch of dumb hicks on their farms, you know, hanging, hanging on to a King James Bible and whatever. Uh, so we need to try to reach these people by being respectable in the world of academia. Well, you combine those two toxic, and they are toxic, characteristics together, then what's going to happen is, is that evolution is going to walk right into your colleges and is going to wreak havoc on the faith of young people, and you're not going to do anything about it, which is exactly what happened. The book says on the bottom of page 80, the young and worldly evangelicals became very enamored with modern scientific thought. Many of them felt that because fundamentalists resisted so much that was taught in the name of science, they had earned the distinction of being obstructionist. It is true that fundamentalists have opposed many modern scientific theories, but such opposition does not make them obstructionist. And so you got this young generation of, of evangelicals coming up, and they're, they're basically calling their grandparents obstructionists, which is a derogatory term, saying that, well, you don't believe in evolution, so therefore you're, you're hindering progress scientifically, uh, which is a, really a slander is what it is. Now you have to also understand at this time that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution was uh, just really gaining so much popularity in the world. You had the Scopes Monkey trial that had happened, and that was just a disaster. Uh, and and this, this idea of evolution is really capturing all the secular universities across the world, and it is infiltrating all the seminaries as well. Now, there was an, a movement out there that tried to reconcile the discrepancy between theology and evolution, and they created something called theistic evolution, 
which is the idea that God created the world to evolve, and uh, which really is a compromise between the two. And the Bible clearly teaches in the book of Genesis that God created the heavens and the earth. And so you have, there's really no, there's no ground to surrender when it comes to evolution. There's no, there's no compromise to be made, but they definitely tried their best to. The book even says here in the middle of page 82, a popular position among young evangelicals was to say that the first few chapters of Genesis teach us theological truth, but not scientific truth. By using this method, non-literalists are able to force these chapters into whatever theory of origin they may hold. Jack Rogers, a man who rejects verbal inspiration, declared, quote, Biblical scholars have long known that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are not theological, or are theological, not scientific information. In, a, in contradiction to this, however, a true scientist and Bible believer has written, quote, In the final analysis, all truth is one. God did not create one universe of physical reality and another of spiritual reality. The same God created all things and His Word was given by His Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. And so you see there that they try to say, well, you know, Genesis is not, it's not scientifically accurate, but it's theologically accurate, which is, it's double speaks what it is. It is uh, the double-minded man is unstable as all his ways. And, and this, is the, this is the hybrid conundrum that evangelicalism has to become because they simply won't separate from error and false teaching and heretics. They have to compromise, and they really end up becoming some sort of, not black or white, but this gigantic shade of gray in the middle, which is, you know, I mean, in every aspect, that is what, uh, what describes evangelicalism perfectly. Now, the first domino that fell was the inspiration of the Bible. The second domino that fell was creationism, and the third domino that fell was feminism. And feminism was becoming a big deal, especially in the 60s. And the idea that, you know, the, the, that women shouldn't be at home, that's a, that's a subordinate role, that's a demeaning thing for a woman to be a housewife or whatever, and we want career women. And I think a lot of that was, uh, was happened after World War II with Rosie the Riveter and, and just this women's power, we can rise up and do it, I am woman, hear me roar type stuff. And, okay, that was going on in the secular world at the time, but that same philosophy infiltrated evangelicalism as well. The book says in the middle of page 83, among the young and worldly evangelicals there arose a religious feminist movement. Some women such as Nancy Hardesty, Sharon Gallagher, and Lucille Sider Dayton became vocal champions of evangelical women's liberation. They unleashed their wrath upon the fundamentalist community and one of their compatriots declared, quote, that woman is inferior to man is an established doctrine in most fundamentalist and evangelical churches. This statement is flawed, deliberately colored by the word inferior. Bible-believing Christians do not hold the woman to be inferior. There is a distinct difference between a woman's being inferior and a woman's being submissive. The first word implies some lack of characteristic of deficiency of ability, whereas the latter word involves a glad and willing response to the Word of God and its instructions concerning women. It is also among the young evangelicals that evangelical feminists first began to appear. Their guru was Paul King Jewett of Fuller Seminary. As mentioned earlier, Jewett's view was that the Pauline instructions of Ephesians and elsewhere concerning women were simply reflections of the culture Paul lived in and do not constitute divine directives for us today. He and others have promoted the right of female ordination to the gospel ministry. And so basically, guys, before feminism infiltrated evangelicalism, there was no such thing as a woman preacher. There just wasn't. And uh, with, you know, in 3rd Adam 3X, we dealt with Catherine Coleman and others like that. Uh, but th those people, women preachers were fringe. They were, they were not mainstream. But because evangelicalism will not separate from error and they allow anything in the door, religious feminism came in. And now you have all these women who want to preach. And this had never happened in the history of Christianity. So the fourth domino to fall was in the philosophy of education. Now, back in these days, if you went to like a Baptist college, they taught you Baptist beliefs. Uh, if you went to a Methodist college, they taught you Methodist beliefs. Same with any denomination. They, they had a set criteria of things that they believed at these schools, and they taught you these, these ideas and these issues. Um, but the idea now be, is that, okay, 
we want to learn everything. We want to learn the, the evangelical position on this, but we also want to learn the, the modernistic theological views on this as well. And so in order to do that, you got to let a modernist come in and teach. And that's, that's what they wanted. Um, you know, like when I went to school, they didn't teach us kind of being a devil's advocate why the Bible had errors. They didn't teach us anything like that. They taught us that the Bible is perfect and the Bible is the Word of God and preach it and believe it and stand with it. Um, and, and, but, but evangelicalism didn't want that anymore. They wanted more of a liberal arts mindset when it came to teaching but now let's just bring all the modernists in and let a, let a modernist professor teach us why the Bible is not the Word of God because that, that would help us be more rounded as, a, as an individual. The book says in the middle of page 85, the purpose of Christian education in the minds of many is to provide a smorgasbord approach. The professor is to spread out before the students all available options and opinions and the student is to take his choice among them. This is conceived by some as liberal education, developing the student's own thought processes and thus making him a mature person. So imagine you got an 18-year-old who sent him off to Bible college and, and like his first year he's sitting in there taking a whole class and some liberal professors up there teaching him why the Bible is not the Word of God. Um, you know, I don't know if I, I... I would be very concerned at that. I would pull my kid out of school... But in their mind, that was a good thing. That was a positive good thing to learn all these, these opposing points of view. So you have the inspiration of the Bible. You have evolution and creation. You have women's religious feminism. And then you have this idea of, well, we're just going to teach all different points of views in the Bible rather than have like a rigid, this is what is right view. The next view that came in, the next, really the next domino that fell in evangelicalism was morality. Now, Guys, I'm going to tell you, doctrines of devils comes in, then these people will eventually behave in a way that is unchristian. Now, everything you believe, whether you like it or not, is doctrinal. The way you, the way you dress is reflective of your views of God. The way you live, the things that come out of your mouth, the, the entertainment that you see in, uh, or don't see, all of that is, is contingent upon your theology. And many people don't like to make that connection, but that is, that is a true thing. Now, I remember years ago, I was in East Tennessee working at a store, and there was this guy came in, and he was from a major Pentecostal university there in Cleveland, Tennessee. And uh, him and I were talking a little bit. We were both in the seminary at the same time. And, uh, and he, he started chuckling a little bit. He said, we're, we're making some changes at our college. And I said, well, what do you mean? Uh, he said, well, we're, we've, we're removing a bunch of old archaic rules from the rule book. And I said, like, like what? Um, what are you talking about? And he, he said that the, uh, one of the deans of the college stood up in chapel the other day and read a bunch of old rules from the 1950s. And the rules were things like no drinking, uh, no, no petting with your girlfriend. You can't hold hands with your girlfriend. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> no, no dancing, no movie theater stuff. And he's laughing as he's telling me this stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, those are the rules at my school. And I, I thank God that I'm going to a school like that because I, I don't want to be in a worldly environment. And I, I was, it really was weird. But that's what happened in evangelicalism. Once doctrine went, then morality went with it. The book says in the middle of page 86, the young and worldly evangelicals adopted a much freer lifestyle than had been commonly accepted among godly Christians. This view is reflected in a book by Fuller Seminary professor Lewis Smeads, Sex for Christians. In the chapter, Responsible Petting, he defended petting as a means of mutual discovery. In a strong statement outlining the attitudes of the young evangelicals, one writer notes, A third major change in contemporary evangelicalism has occurred in cultural attitudes. Separated from the wider culture by a simple and individualistic Christian ethic characteristic of modern revivalism, the righteous life for evangelicals was most often marked by a platitudinous legalism. Smoking, drinking, dancing, theater going, and gambling, for instance, were disallowed. Reacting against what they consider oppressive legalism, younger evangelicals have almost universally rejected these taboos as binding. And the use of four-letter words even is readily apparent at times in their conversation and writing. It is also clear that with upward social mobility and cultural accommodation, evangelicalism as a whole, even some of the more conservative evangelical churches, colleges, seminaries, and campus ministries, no longer spend much time uh, condemning the older distinctive taboos that have now become socially dysfunctional drinking in 
particular. So basically what he's saying is, is that uh, it used to be that a young Christian person, it was just a generally accepted view. They didn't drink, they didn't smoke, they didn't cuss, they didn't get tattoos, they didn't go to the movie theaters, uh, and they didn't, they didn't say cuss words, four-letter words. But the writer here is now saying that all of that now is gone, and evangelicals are cussing, they are drinking, and when we're speaking about college students here, evangelical college students are now cussing, they are now drinking, they are now getting tattoos, they are now going to the movie theaters, and uh, and I'm you know I know from personal knowing a lot of these people, most of them are sexually active. Okay, uh, guys, this is what evangelicalism has become, and it still is that way today, largely. And if you don't believe me, I dare you, go walk across the campus of Liberty University today. Go do it. You will find there are a bunch of students there who are getting tattoos, they are drinking, they are cussing, movie theaters is no big deal to them, and, uh, and, and I, you know, I can't say, speak for everybody when it comes to their personal morality, but I promise you there is a lot, a lot of promiscuity, and it's not even, it's not even attacked. It, it's seen as legalism by these people. This is neo-evangelicalism, and it's still that way today. And this is one of many reasons why I simply do not call myself an evangelical. The book goes on to say on page 88, The second generation of evangelicals, while not denying the necessity for some doctrinal framework, were committed to the tearing down of as many doctrinal barriers as possible. They saw doctrine as a stumbling block to evangelical ecumenicity and as a barrier to fellowship. It even says there at the very end, Professor Bernard Ram of Eastern Baptist Seminary denounced an adversary scholarship that attacks, destroys, and puts others down. Isn't it strange that God has given us spiritual weapons dedicated to the pulling down a stronghold, 2 Corinthians 10.4? Rather sounds like an attack mode, does it not? And so that really is chapter 4, uh, the dominoes that fell. And I'm outlining this uh, just in my own interpretation of this book. But the dominoes that fell in evangelicalism and the second generation of evangelicalism was the inspiration of the Bible. They would not separate from evolution. Matter of fact, they accommodated evolution and created something called theistic evolution and uh, would not denounce it as 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 erroneous and theologically incorrect. Then also women's feminism came within the ranks of all that. And then fourthly, you've got the idea that, you know, we just want to, we want to learn all different points of view when it comes to theology and all kinds of uh, teachings in the world. And so really they, they weren't very strict on what they taught in the college. There was people in there teaching all kinds of weird stuff and they welcomed that. And then also number five was the morality of evangelicalism declined rapidly. And now, you know, a seminary student used to be a clean cut young guy. Now he's a guy with tattoos and drinking and smoking and cussing. So that is what evangelicalism had become. And that is chapter four of The Tragedy of Compromise by Mr. Ernest Pickering. Love this book. We're going to give many more of the chapters here. I believe there's seven in total. We're going to go through all these together and it is going to be a great blessing. You're going to really enjoy this. Subscribe if you're new and if this has been a blessing to you, you can make a donation in the PayPal as well. So God bless you, friend, and uh, we'll see you next time.